Well, good evening, everyone. Thank y'all so much for coming. Um, we are so glad y'all are here. And uh, of course, this session and our session later tonight are going to be the same. Um, so the and the group split pretty evenly as far as registering for tonight. So uh, so we'll have about the same number, I think, tonight. Um, but hopefully everybody can come back tomorrow uh, for as much of the uh, workshop as possible. Um, we're super excited. First, I want to thank, uh, thank Katie uh, Pinnock for putting this together, for this is her, her passion uh, that she's been wanting to do for a while now. In fact, she brought it up so long ago that when we brought it back up again, everyone had forgotten about it. So, um, so this has been something Katie's wanted us to do, and I'm so grateful for her for that um, and what she means to our family here. Um, and Dean, we're so glad to have you here with us. Y'all are going to enjoy uh, hearing from Dean. Um, uh, Katie and I had lunch with him today, and we've spoken with him over the phone quite a bit. Um, and it's always been a very pleasant, enjoyable experience. And I know he's going to um, speak uh, from something that he's very—he's also very passionate about as well. So that was evident the first time I spoke with him over the phone. Um, I know I don't want to steal any of his thunder at all. Um, but one of the stories that I've, has always meant something to me, y'all, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to to ask something that is kind of a, a basic question. Y'all remember Reader's Digest, right? Okay. I, I, this crowd, I think, remembers Reader's Digest. All right. Um, I'll never forget reading a story in Reader's Digest. My parents got that magazine my entire life, um, and I usually read from it quite a bit. Um, and I'll never forget a story of a young boy in middle school, maybe even elementary grade, who received an award from his, from his uh, city one day uh, because his school bus got in an accident. And it wasn't a major accident, but, but the kids needed to get off the bus. And in that accident, he was the one who took charge and got the, all those kids off the bus in a very timely, organized manner. And when the stories came out afterwards, the city said, well, we need to, we need to give this kid an award for being such a brave young man. And at the ceremony, the mayor asked him, how on earth, you know, were you able to keep your head and do this? You're one of the youngest kids on the bus, and yet you were able to do that. And he said, well, he goes, every once in a while, I would think, what would I do if we got into a, an accident? And he goes, I started thinking, what would be the most important thing? What would I do? And, I, you know, I'd try to get people to the exits and, you know. And he goes, and then when it happened, I knew what to do. And he said, and I said, and I said, that's the basic, that's the basic of training right there, right? Is 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 to forewarn people what to do, to think about it, and then you're prepared for it. And so as I as I think about this this workshop and what Dean's gonna bring to us, that's what I'm thinking is, you know, how how can this prepare me um, not just for a possible future, but but for right now. Um, and so I'm so excited about that, and I, I think it's gonna do us so much good. So let me pray for Dean and for his his message, and and like I said earlier, that it'd be the message of God, and then uh, I'll let Dean take over. Our Father in heaven, we're just so grateful for, uh, for you, most of all, and for uh, this church family. Lord, we're, we're grateful that you uh, bring people into our lives to love and to cherish and to support us and, um, and who we can and pour ourselves into as well. Uh, and God, we know that the reality of that is that those people, we sometimes lose them. Um, and we know that, that death and grief are a part of our life. Loss is always going to be... Um, a constant in, in the life of humans. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would help us to, to open our minds and our hearts to, to what Dean has to say to us, to, um, to prepare us for, uh, for this kind of thing, not only in our own lives, but as we minister to those around us and to those in our lives, God. Um, and Lord, man, we look forward to the day when there will be no more tears, when there will be no more sorrow or pain. Um, Lord, where there will be no more loss at all because we will be with you forever and ever. Lord, we just thank you and we pray that you be with us at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Dean. I want to start by thanking you for choosing to be here this afternoon. I realize that uh, when I go and do these workshops, it is not an attractive, positive pleasant subject to sell to the public. You know, the things that are not positive, not pleasant, or things that make us feel uncomfortable, typically we back away from those things. That's what we human beings do. But you know, some things are so important and they're so inevitable that we really need to stop doing that. 
uh, we need to stop backing away. You know, at some point in time, we need to become more mature and wiser and realize that sometimes we just need to be willing to volunteer to get in that uncomfortable space or to expose ourselves to some things that maybe we don't like to think about much, but it's inevitable. And we need to do some prepping for those inevitable things. And maybe we can help ourselves help other people prep for their times as well. You know, we're going to be talking about uh, in this session, life, love, and loss. It's not going to last for two hours. It's probably going to be more like uh, an hour and a half of your time. We're going to give you a break in between. Uh, I realize it's difficult to keep people's attention for a long period of time. So we're going to do the best we can to create an open atmosphere here, very relaxed. As a matter of fact, over across the way, there's some coffee. Feel free to go over there and get uh, some coffee if you'd like. If at some point in time you need to stand up because of your back or maybe you're feeling a little drowsy and you need to stand up, you feel free to do that. You don't even have to turn your cell phone off. If your cell phone goes off, it's fine. I turned mine off. I didn't think there was any reason for you to hear the Ohio State fight song. Uh, So I uh, want you to feel very casual and very relaxed. I don't want to come here and lecture to you. Uh, I didn't come to Somerville to preach to you unless you show up Sunday morning, then I'm going to preach at you. But the rest of the time, I'd like for us to have more of like a discussion type of setting, and I want you to feel free to participate at any point in time. Nobody knows everything about anything. That's literally true. Um, I do not know everything about life, love, and loss. I don't know everything about widowhood. I don't know everything about marriage. I don't know everything about anything, uh, nor do you. Now, there are people who think they do. Those are troublemakers. Those people are problematic. But I can learn from you, and hopefully you can learn a little from me too. Now, I think because this is a heavy subject, One thing that is really important is to kind of lighten the atmosphere a little bit because this can be a pretty heavy personal kind of discussion. The Bible talks about in Proverbs 17 how that in regard to uh, levity or humor, it's described as good like medicine. A merry heart is good like medicine. And I really believe that's true. You know, sometimes I think lightening the atmosphere can help a little bit. So let me share with you uh, some things that uh, I found on the Internet. So they've got to be true. I found them on the Internet. Okay, here's this one guy. He gets on and he brags. He said, I got myself a senior GPS. It not only tells me how to get to my destination, it tells me why I wanted to be there. (laughs) You probably had that problem on occasion. The other day, I walked into a room. And I want to brag here for a minute. I walked into a room and I remembered why I went there. Now, it was the bathroom, but still, I was really proud of myself. I thought that was an achievement. Here is a a fellow reporting about a challenging situation with his wife. You know, for some reason, women are not always on the same page as men, especially after they say, I do. We had some extra dollars last month he says. So we voted on what to do with the extra dollars. She voted, save it. I voted, buy a pickup. It was a one-to-one tie until overnight there were 139,000 votes that came in for a new truck, and my wife was suspicious for some reason. Uh, In the past, we would drop something and immediately reach down and pick it up. Now, I just stand there and stare at it and say, do I really need this that bad? Or when you get down there, you say, you scope things out. Is there anything else while I'm down here that I can get while I'm down here? Uh, I like this story. An elderly man with hearing problems went to an ENT, an ear, nose, and throat uh, doctor, and got himself uh, all fixed up. Full strength, hearing perfect. A couple weeks after that, he went in for a checkup and everything was fine. The doctor said, I'll bet your family is delighted My family doesn't know. I haven't told them about my hearing. I just sit quietly and listen. I've changed my will four times in the past month. (laughs) Oh, boy. Yeah, be careful what you say, even in the presence of somebody who you think cannot hear. Mm. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about a, I think, a really challenging subject. Uh, this can get a, 
get to be a really challenging subject. I'll bet uh, from looking around, I would never suggest I could guess your age, but just from looking around, I see a good bit of life experience here. So I think that some of you will be able to really relate to what we're going to be talking about here. So let's start, uh, let's start off by talking about life. I love that picture. That is such a neat picture. I just want to take my hand and pat that little rear end sticking up there in the air. Now, when babies are born into the world, they're innocent, vulnerable, totally dependent. I want you to think now with me for a little bit about the world that we're born into. Give me six. Let's, let's shoot for six. Surely in a group this large, we can do that. Give me six words or phrases that you would use to describe the world that we live in, the world that life is experienced in. At the moment, At the moment what? Chaotic. Chaotic. Boy, isn't that the truth. <laughs> chaotic and seems to be trending toward more chaotic. Yes. Give me another word. Confused. What? Confused. confused. Chaotic, confused. Boy, it doesn't take long watching the news to figure out that there's a lot of confusion in the world, isn't there? About a lot of things. Politics, ethics, relationships, marriage. Um, give me another one. Chaos, confusion. Hazardous. hazardous. Oh, my. Boy, that's the truth. We live in a hazardous world, don't we? Give me another one. Can you give me a... Kind. How? Kind. 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 Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you remind me of Jesse Waters on, uh, yeah. on Fox News. This, my name is Jesse, this is my world right here. You know, this is my world, you're in my world. Uh, evidently, you're blessed to be in her world. It's a kind world. That's a good world to live in. There is a lot of kindness in the world. What else? Busy? We live very hectic lives, don't we? Very, life is very fast-paced. You know, I want to commend you for taking time out of your day to come here. I consider your time to be extremely valuable. I hope you do as well. You know, we only have a limited amount of it. We have no idea what our capacity, what our maximum is going to be. Minutes are important. Uh, every hour, every day is very valuable. For you to take time out of your life to come here speaks volumes about you especially in light of the fact that you know what we're going to be talking about. I want to commend every single one of you who made the choice to be here this afternoon. I know there are other places you could have been, other things you could have done, but you chose to be here. You ought to be commended. I'd take you to Disney World if I could afford it. Well, it's, it's even cold down there now, so maybe not. Well, uh, give, me, give me one more. Can you give me one more? Selfish. Selfish. Boy, we are... We have become a very selfish world, haven't we? Everybody's out for themselves. Now, did you notice, in regard to the things that were mentioned, only with the exception of one thing that was mentioned, there's something similar about all the other ones. What's the one thing that's different about all the others when you look at the word kind? All those other descriptions, what do they have in common? Negative. They're all negative. They're all negative. There is a lot of negative in the world, isn't there? There is a lot of negative. And that can create uh, some pretty challenging life experiences in regard to our attitude, our perspective, our morale, because those negatives, you know... <clears throat> Those negatives can really cause us to feel ways that are very difficult to feel. And to function even in ways that we would typically not function. But those negatives can get such a hold on us that they really can impact a lot of our life. Now I want to go to this slide and I want you to ask, ask you to look at this slide. And when you look at this slide, tell me when you look at it, 
What message do you get? Positive. positive. Okay, you get a positive. Why do you get a positive message? Okay. It appears. Now, did you notice both words are plurals? Remember in English, most of you probably slept in that class, in English class. You know, verbs have tenses. Then you've got nouns. They have number. Okay, both of these are the number plural. They're not singular, they're plural. This is, I think, a good depiction of life in the world that we live in. I think it's an accurate depiction. Both of them are plural, blessings and burdens, both plural nouns. Now, it appears, though, the signal or the image appears to be sending a message What is the message about blessings? What's the message about blessings there when you look at that image? They far outweigh the burdens. Okay. There's more of them, and they outweigh them. You know, both blessings and burdens have... They not only have number, but they have value or weight. A qualitative value. When you look at that, that is a good depiction of how life really is. I have a, a display table I take with me everywhere I go. And one of the books on this display table is a, uh, a book that is called 1,000 Gifts. And this is a book that records this woman's commitment to list a thousand blessings in her life. Thus the title, 1,000 Gifts. It's a very interesting book. One of the things that she does in this book is helps us to look more specifically at our life in a more detailed fashion at our life and see the multitude of the blessings. Now, Remember Job in the Old Testament? In the story of Job, does anybody remember how blessed he was? Can you think, just from your past reading or acquaintance with the book, give me something that was a blessing that Job had in his life? His family. His family. As a matter of fact, he had a big family. Does anybody remember how many kids? It's like a tribe. Double digits. Ten. Seven sons, three daughters. Now, him and his wife are really smart. Because if you're going to run a farm with a bunch of critters, you need farm hands. So I figure those seven sons and three daughters came in real handy. In the introduction of him, there's mention of the fact that he had ten children. And that he had all kinds of critters. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of critters. Now, what else did he have? Uh, at one point, he end, ends up dealing with physical illness. Yeah. What did he have in the way of blessings, though? He was a hugely wealthy man. I mean, he was super, super wealthy. Can you think of anything else about him? Yeah. Why wouldn't he have the expectations of a very good future? Hope. I mean, when you're blessed like that. Now, hey, by the way, nobody's mentioned this yet, but what about his marital status? Was he single? He wasn't a single parent. He had a wife. So he has a wife. He has 10 children. He has all kinds of uh, livestock. He... Um, has no apparent health issues of a prominent nature at the outset of the book. Um, how about human relationships? Oh, surely. Uh, well, yeah, he, well, he no doubt was. I'm sure some people were jealous of his prosperity. But then he also, well, as a matter of fact, when he got in really bad shape, who came to visit him? He had friends. He had friends. Do you put them on your I'm thankful for list? 
So here he is with all of these blessings. Now, I'm going to read to you something that he said. Now, imagine this coming from the man we just talked about. This is Job chapter 14, verse 1. Some of you, uh, I'm sure I've heard this verse before. Some of you may even be able to quote this verse. But here is Job, and here's what he says. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Now, wait a minute. We just, we just talked about how super blessed he was. What in the world would cause him to say man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble? By the way, is that an accurate or an inaccurate statement? Have you ever stopped to think about this now? Break it down this way. Let me, let me, let's make it real easy. Man that is born of woman, is that true? Do you know any other way to get born? Okay, man that is born of woman. Now you've got to check mark that one, right? Man that is born of woman is a few days. Is that right? Now, wait a minute. Before you agree to that, I have a bunch of Facebook friends, and occasionally, when somebody reaches a certain mark, there is a posting about this celebration. They hit the 90 mark, or they hit the 100 mark, and we talk about their long life. There are people who live close to 100, people who exceed 100. Job said, a few days. Is what he said true or false? It, yeah, it depends on perspective. You're right. It depends on perspective. If... Uh, <clears throat> If a child is born with, um, if a child's born and they, they end up dying at age three, is that a long life or a short life? Yeah, very brief, isn't it? If a person gets cancer and suffers for three years, is that a long three years or a short three years? It's a long three years, isn't it? Not only perspective, but circumstances color our view about what's short and what's long. I love the uh, observation that it depends on perspective and then was mentioned about God's perspective. I was driving on Van Drive in Jackson, Tennessee one day and had the radio on. I was listening to this preacher. I don't have any idea what church he was from. I was just listening to him and he made a statement an observation about wisdom, I'd never heard this before. As soon as he said it, I thought, wow, that's a really great point. I'd never thought about that before. He said, wisdom is when you see something from God's perspective. Bing, bing, bing. That's what I heard in my head when I heard that statement. I thought, man, that is so right. If, if you see marriage the way God sees marriage you've got wisdom about marriage. If you see human relationships, if you see stewardship, if you see anything from God's perspective, you've got wisdom about that topic. God sees things eternally. As a matter of fact, the prophet Isaiah says he inhabits eternity. So what is uh, 110 years when you compare it to eternity. It's a few days, isn't it? Uh, Psalm uh, 90 uh, talks about the possibility of living three score and 10, 70 years, or if by reason of strength, 80 maybe. Well, the reality is no longer, no, no matter how long you live in this world, it's gonna be a short time when you look at it 
from an eternal perspective. And that's the way we ought to. Job was right. Man that is born of woman is a few days. No matter how long they live, they're a few days. Now look at the last phrase. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Now what about that part of what he said? Agree or disagree? You can say, this is a comfortable atmosphere. Is what he said true? Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Okay, depends on how you look at the word trouble. Okay. Anybody else? Your statement reminds me of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. Yeah, we're, we're not in paradise anymore. Yeah, this is a different world. Yeah, full of trouble. You don't see any trouble in the Garden of Eden. I mean, you see peace and intimacy with God, and then all that got ruined when sin entered into the world. Let me ask you this. Um, this uh, 16.9 fluid ounces of water, Okay, now, if I filled this up, now, I've drank, is it drank or drunk? Either way, I was asleep that day in English class. Um, so if we fill this up all the way to the top, uh, it's full, right? What else can be in it when it's full? You've got a good point. What if I were to fill it all the way to the brim and you couldn't put another drop of water in it? Would it be full? Would you agree? Okay, now, now I have, I've drank some out of it. I drink a little more. Now we're down to about here. Now, how would you describe that bottle of water in relationship to the quantity in it? Three-fourths, Three -fourths? okay. Mostly full. How about, you know, you hear... It's a little bit empty. It's a little bit empty. <laughs> okay. And every one of those descriptions is uh, accurate. Now, let me give you another one. It's full. It has water in it, and it has air in it. It's full. Um, was all Job had in his life trouble? No. Now, what trouble did he have, though? Let, let's go back to the first part of the story. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that story. What happened to this super prospering man? Married man who had ten children. Okay, before he became, he did become very ill. Um, boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Okay, how about before that? So he... Uh, the devil was allowed to do a lot of mischief. Yeah, the devil was allowed to do a lot of mischief, a good way of putting it. You have this controversy that we are able to read about, but Job didn't have any understanding or knowledge of, this controversy between God and Satan. God totally confident in Job and the man he was. The devil questioned the integrity of Job. And Satan said, hey, God, what do you expect? You know, you've developed this hedge around him. You're pouring all these blessings in. I mean, he's going to kiss up to you. He's going to keep kissing up to you because you keep pouring the blessings in. God, stop doing that. You know, mess with him and see what happens. God says, I ain't messing with him. But God says, if you want to mess with him, you go right ahead. But God was still in control. Uh, the book of Job is not just about human suffering. It's about the sovereignty of God. God was in control. God drew the lines and Satan had to color inside the lines. So God said, okay, I ain't going to mess with him. If you want to, go ahead, but don't you dare touch him. So what did Satan do? What did Job lose? Okay, how many of you in this, sitting in this room have lost a child? 
okay, there's a, a decent number. That is about as unnatural as loss could possibly get. You know, we think about burying our grandparents. You know, we think about burying our parents. The thought of burying a child is just so abnormal. It's so unnatural. It's, it's just a, a super unique kind of a, of a loss. Now, he didn't just lose one child. He lost all 10. Now, in addition to that, what did he lose? That, that is horrific to think about losing 10 children. What else did he lose? All his worldly goods. Those, you know, all that livestock. He lost, he lost all of his livestock, all of that prosperity. So he's stripped of his prosperity. He has lost his children. And there he is. And miserable as you would expect because he's a human being. Now, you know, when God has made his point, you know, Job doesn't turn his back on God, but Satan's still not convinced. And Satan says, well, you mess with him, touch him. And, you know, the Lord said, no, I ain't touching him. If you want to do it, go ahead, but don't you dare take his life. You can touch him, but don't take his life. That's where the illness came in. The phys he lost his physical health, too. Now, what about the support of his wife? What did she say to him? Yeah, she got to the end of a rope. And she said, curse God and die. Now, I want you to cut that woman some slack. I hadn't thought about this. I'll admit, I hadn't thought about this for a few decades in my life. But I'm beginning more and more to wrap my brain around this and have sympathy for her. Because what had she lost? She had lost 10 children. She had carried those children. She went through labor and travail for those children. She nursed those children. She cared for those children. She was the homemaker for those children. Job isn't the only one suffering in the book of Job. His wife lost all of her prosperity, lost her sense of security, lost her children. You know what happens when you experience tremendous, tremendous loss in your life? It causes you to say and do some things that you might never have done if you hadn't experienced the loss. It can cause you to say and do things that are way out of character. I'm not suggesting she didn't do wrong. I'm just suggesting that, hey, we need to be sympathetic toward her just like we're sympathetic toward Job. She suffered greatly too. But he got to the point where he said his life was full of trouble. But was his life literally full of trouble? Why did he say something so extreme? I mean, full. Full of trouble? If your life's full of trouble, do you have any blessings? Mm. Give me some blessings he had at the worst point in his life. Name me some blessings he still had at the worst point in his life. He still had his life. He had, he had a heart was still beating. Blood was still coursing through his veins. He still had a brain and it was functioning. He was still alive. You know, there are times that it would be good for us to think more specifically about our blessings before we begin a conversation with God to thank Him. I try to walk, um, well, my goal is to walk three miles every day. And there are times before I go out to walk or when I come back, I thank the Lord for the ability to walk. Have you ever thanked the Lord for the ability to walk? for the ability to get up out of bed. This morning, you got up out of bed. Do you know how many people would give greatly everything they had for the ability to get up out of bed? 
We did that this morning. Or this afternoon if you slept in. But either way, you know, think about the black... Job was still living. Now, what else did he have still? He still had his wife. Do you know what some of us would give to still have our mate? Talk to me privately about that. He still had, she may not have been a million dollar wife, okay? She may not have been a five star, okay? But he still had a wife. He still had his life. He still had a wife. What else did he still have? Friends. He still had friends. As a matter of fact, those three guys that we read about, that again, we're so hard on them. These three guys. Now, have you ever stopped to think about this for a minute? You know, there's, there's levels of, of friendships, you know, of human relationships. How do you know that these guys, these three men, how do you know they were really good friends? Have you ever stopped to think about this? What did they give up that proves they were really good friends? They dropped everything in their life. Now, do you figure they had something else to do? Now, I'm, I'm kind of figuring that Job's friends were probably more of the elite category. You know, he probably had some pretty wealthy friends. You know, these guys may have been in that category too. They dropped everything. And wherever they were, they came to him. Do you know what a tremendous gift that is to have people in your life like that? Because you know what? I mentioned it at the outset. Do you know why a lot of times people who have experienced loss are not properly cared for? It's because the so-called friends in that person's life treasure more their comfort zone than caring for their friend. You know one thing that really, I, if you want to set me off, if you want to tick me off really quick, come to me and say that you won't do something because it's out of your comfort zone. That is about as unchristian of a spirit that a human being could have. The cross wasn't about comfort. It was about surrender. It was about sacrifice. It was about death. And if we are unwilling to go to people because their circumstance makes us feel uncomfortable, what does that say about us? Those three friends dropped everything in their life, traveled to where Job was, and not only that, but they had the right motive in mind. You know, I think sometimes we're so hard on these guys that we, you know, we think, Man, these guys came there and they came there and they're going to rip him up one side and down the other. No, that wasn't their intent at all. That was not what they were planning on doing. As a matter of fact, let me read to you here. When Job's three friends, this is in chapter 2, when Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes. It sounds like this was a pretty quick trip too. Not something scheduled. This was a pretty quick... They hear the need, they drop everything, and they met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. That was their purpose. To sympathize him and to comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. Loss can cause you to look different. Now, obviously, his skin condition may have affected that. But if you read books about grief and about loss, grief can also, and loss can cause you to change your appearance. You can look different. You know, we talk about a person's demeanor and how they carry themselves. They could not hardly even recognize him. They came for the right reason. Now, when they opened their mouth, that's where the problem started. I have said on occasion, and remember, by the way, by the way, when they dropped everything and came to him, do you remember how long they were quiet and sat with him? Seven days. Yeah, seven days. Now, 
If those were female friends, there's no way in the world they would have lasted seven days sitting there with him saying nothing. I'm joking, ladies. I'm joking. Uh, But it is scientifically proven. You say more words. I can show you the evidence. You say more words in a day than a man does. That's proven. You probably have more valuable things to say, too, by the way. But anyway, so they come for seven days. And you know how they're ministering to him? They're ministering to him by their presence. You want to help somebody who has suffered loss in their life. Drop everything. Go to them. You don't have to have a speech prepared. You don't have to say a word. As a matter of fact, sometimes opening up your mouth, that's when you insert foot. I did that recently in a text with Katie, and I had to correct it. But anyway, um, it's ministry of presence. That's what people who have lost loved ones and lost other things of significance, it's what they need. They need people in their lives who love them enough to expose themselves to the uncomfortableness of other people's lives and the pain and the agony of other people's lives. Job had that. He was so blessed. Even when he was in the worst of predicaments in his life circumstances, he was still tremendously blessed. I will suggest to you this. There was never a time in Job's life, never a time in Job's life when he was more burdened than blessed. I will also say this, though I don't know you. There never has been and never will be in your life a time when you're more burdened than you are blessed. We are all more blessed than we're burdened. And that's always true. We may not see that. We may not recognize that. But this is the reality. Always, no matter what we're going through in our life, But the problem is, just like with Job, his burdens blinded him to his blessings. That's why he said such an extreme thing that his life was full of trouble. His life was not full of trouble. He was very troubled. He was very troubled. He was also very, very blessed. But he couldn't think about his blessings because his burdens blinded him. That doesn't have to happen to us. It's tempting. It can happen. It does happen to us. But it doesn't have to happen. What we need to do is keep focusing on our blessings. Every day, no matter what our circumstances, no matter what our challenges, no matter how many burdens and how heavy those burdens are, what we've got to do is we've got to keep thinking about how blessed we are because we're always more blessed then we're burdened. I have a daughter who is an avid Facebooker. I didn't start Facebooking until after my wife passed away about eight years ago. And I decided that I was going to one-up my daughter. She likes hashtags. And so she would hashtag blessed beyond measure. And I thought, when I get on Facebook, I'm going to beat her. I'm going to one-up that girl. So I hashtagged blessed beyond both measure and merit. Blessed beyond both measure and merit. And we are. That's true of every single one of us. We're blessed more than we could possibly calculate. And way beyond anything that we deserve. Far beyond our needs. We are richly, richly blessed. If you want to help yourself worship more effectively, where it really impacts your life, before you come into this room, spend some time maybe out in the car in the parking lot thinking about how blessed you are and about the giver of those gifts, the good and perfect gifts. They always come from God, James 1, verse 17. Come into this room with a heart full of gratitude. That'll help you to worship really effectively. The reality is this world, though, is it's just a really hard place to live sometimes. Um, 1 John 5, 19, for instance, says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 says the devil's like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. There's temptations and sin everywhere. Jesus said in John 16, in this world you will have tribulation. 
Man, this world is not an easy place to live. It really is difficult. It really is challenging. But we've got to be up to the challenge. Never let your burdens blind you to your blessings. We need to realize that though life is very difficult and we are going to experience loss, we are always more blessed than we deserve and blessed beyond what we could count. Now, I want to share with you this slide before we take a break. Does anybody know, when you see that picture, what movie that picture came out of? Christmas Story. Okay. Does anybody know the city where that movie was recorded? You can go to it. You can visit the house, as a matter of fact. Bing, 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 bing. Remind me tomorrow. If you're here tomorrow, I'm going to get you a gift. Oh, do you? Okay. Okay. Hartville, Ohio, where I was for 33 years with the church there, is about an hour south of Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah, 1983, Cleveland, Ohio, the Christmas story. Now, does anybody know the name of the guy whose tongue is stuck to the pole? <laughs> is he the kind of person that would do something that dumb? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Oh, good one, good one. Hey, don't Google that. Do you know the name of the guy whose tongue is stuck to the pole? If you do, I'm going to bring you a gift tomorrow too. Do you know the name of the other guy? That's the easy part. Ralphie, Ralphie. Remember the Red Rider BB gun? Okay, Flick. Flick is the name of his friend who gets the tongue stuck to the... Remember what happened? Oh, the fire department shows up, the police department shows up, half of the community shows up, everything is chaotic because he got his tongue stuck to the pole. By the way, uh, you, not now, later, uh, you can go home and uh, Google this. Triple dog dare scene, that's what it's called. Triple dog dare scene, and this will come up and you can see that, you can refresh your memory about that experience in that movie. Now, do you think that he planned on getting his tongue attached to that pole? Not even that Appleby guy would do that. I mean, uh, let's, let's, uh, there, are, there are things in our life that we become attached to. I use love in that sense, in the real generic way our world uses love. There are things that, that we become attached to people even that we become attached to, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, we become attached to things. Well, what happens when you lose, you suffer loss of something that you become real attached to? What effect does that have on you? That's what we're going to talk about. Okay, now obviously... When, when we have lost a spouse or another person in our life, a sibling, a child, a parent, obviously that's going to have an impact on us. We're going to struggle with that because we're attached to people. Now, outside of people, I want you to name some things that if a person lost them, it would really matter to them. It would have an impact on them. Something other than people. Name something that if we lost it, it would really have an impact on us because we're attached to it. Dogs and cats. I've never done a pet funeral yet. I figure I'm going to be called on, I hope not for at least 10 years. There is a Australian Labradoodle, as a matter of fact, there are two Australian Labradoodles in Gainesville, Florida that belong to my grandchildren, and if either one of those dogs ever die, we're going to have to have a memorial service. Isn't it amazing that, you know, you have these animals that come into your life, they're just pets, 
but they sometimes become a part of your family. Yeah, pets. You know, there are pet cemeteries. I, okay, I don't understand it, okay? But somebody, some business person was smart enough to know that that's, that's an option. Pet cemeteries. Um, okay, pets. Name me something else that if it was lost, it really mattered to a person. Wallet. Wallet. Yeah. Hey, what about a wedding ring? Any of you ladies ever don't, you know, don't raise your hand. Um, but, you know, wallet, wedding ring. How about your phone? Have you ever lost your phone? That's like half your brain. Well, three quarters of some of our brains. Uh, name something else. Car keys, okay. Job. Let me tell you about Clyde. Clyde was a member of the church in Hartville, Ohio, where I preached for 33 and a third years. I was there as a minister. And uh, Clyde Grimmett was his name. He worked for Firestone in the, in the uh, corporate office in Akron, Ohio, which used to be referred to as the rubber capital of the world. He worked there for 39 years. He was an accountant. He not only worked five days a week, but he often went on Saturdays, very conscientious employee. That job became a part of his identity. One day they came in and said, Clyde, we're going to move your job down to Nashville. Bridgestone, the Japanese, had bought Firestone. They decided to move the corporate headquarters down to Nashville, Tennessee. He was told, we're going to move your job down to Nashville, Tennessee. He said, I don't want to move to Nashville, Tennessee. And they said, we don't want you to move there either. That was his retirement. He was retired by the company in that fashion. You think that mattered to him? I'll guarantee it did. As a matter of fact... Things were such, my oldest daughter works for Bridgestone Firestone in Nashville, Tennessee. And I know about what effect that had when they, when they kicked him out. Michelle said things got to be a mess down in Nashville. <clears throat> and they started complaining down in Nashville. It got back to some of the corporate people. And what they decided to do was go back to Clyde and say, Clyde, we'd like for you to come back and help us. He said, ain't no way. I ain't coming back. He was mad. And understandably so. Things still were a mess. They still went on. My daughter said things were still a mess. People still complaining down in Nashville. They went back to Clyde again. Clyde told me this part. He said, Dean, they came back to me and said, Clyde, what would it take to get you to come back? And here's what he told me. He said, I named a number that I knew they would not match. And they matched it. He was just grinning like a chessy cat. Man, was he ever on cloud nine. He went back for a few months and helped him out, and he walked away with his dignity, his pride. Yeah, the loss of a job can really have an impact on somebody. Name something else that you might lose. A house. In Villarica, Georgia, there's a young couple. Uh, they have, I think, two or three children. I forget which. Their home burned down about 9 o'clock one night. It's a good thing they weren't asleep. If they'd been asleep, they may have all died. But their house caught fire. They all were able to get out, but they lost everything in that home. You think that shook them? You think they've been grieving? Yeah, still grieving. Now, what is the big deal? Uh, I can go on Zillow. And I can, well, they inflate the prices, I think. But anyway, I can go on Zillow and I can find out what the value of your home is. It's just dollars and cents, okay? What is the big deal about losing your house? Things in your house. Oh, oh, the things. What things in the house? Like photos. I think that's what we Yeah. <laughs> memories and photos. And why do you have those memories? Because you lived there. Who did you live there with? Those people. And what experiences did you have? And what memories did you accumulate? And now that home is destroyed. Could be by flood. You know, could be by hurricane. Could by, be by tornado. Yeah, there's going to be a, grief, a serious grieving that that family is going to do because they've lost their home. 
you become, we become attached to things. We, the value, what is the value? I drive a car at home. Now, when I travel, I get a rental car for the sake of the ministry because it's cheaper than them paying me 54 cents a mile. But I have a car that's worth about $2,500. It's a 2012 Nissan Versa. Um, that's about all it's worth, 2500 Maybe on a good day, if I found a sucker, $3,000. Uh, that's the value of that, that car. Um, it can be replaced. It can be replaced. I had a 1959 Peugeot station wagon, though. In 1971, a friend of mine and me, uh, we each paid $25 and bought this 1959 Peugeot station wagon for $50. It was what we called a class day car. We got a can of paint and some brushes, and we painted it and drove it around. We were the coolest seniors in 1971. Um, and one day I took it to go play tennis at the uh, park. And after I got done playing tennis, I got in it, and I started it up. And um, it had a manual transmission on the column, on the steering column. And I, and I started it up, and when I started it up, the accelerator stuck to the floor. As soon as that happened, I knew what happened. As soon as that happened, I reached down there real quick, as fast as I could, to flip the accelerator just a split second late, though. I lost the engine. Man, I hated... Oh, that was a really cool car. Um, you know, there are, there are times that you experience these losses that... It just has the, sometimes a short-term effect, sometimes a long-term effect. Um, how, about, how about losing your health? Anybody here get diagnosed with cancer? If you did, do you think it would matter to you? Oh, yeah. You think it um, might cause you to have some sleepless nights? Maybe struggle with the uh, temptation to worry excessively. Yeah. How about, think about this. What about a guy goes off to war? He comes back with one less limb. Or maybe two less limbs. Do you think he's going to grieve that loss? He sure is. Think about people who go through the agony of divorce. Never minimize the loss of marriage by divorce. That is a tremendous stress. As a matter of fact, the academic studies that have been done, they rate losses. They, they rate stressors. They call them stressors. The stressors that you can experience in this life, and they have a way of doing these surveys to assess this. The number one and number two life stressor in any study I've ever seen, is always the same. Number one is loss of spouse. Number two is divorce. Have you ever thought about a young lady who grew up in the church, became a Christian, deeply devoted to the Lord? She goes off to college. And in an act of violence, she's raped. What has she lost? Her virginity. Do you think she's going to grieve that? How many times do you lose your virginity? Flip the coin the other way. That, that same young lady doesn't lose her virginity that way. But this godly-hearted young lady, in the heat of passion gives away her virginity. Do you think she's going to mourn, grieve, because of the sin she's participated in? She has a godly heart, she will. There are so many that sometimes we, we lose friendships. Um, sometimes we're betrayed or we're neglected by our friends and we, we lose friendships. There are so many things in our life that we can lose that will have a real strong impact on us. And it will cause us to experience what we call grief. And we'll struggle with that. 
We'll struggle with it in regard to our thinker. We'll struggle with it in regard to our feeler. Now, you're not going to read this in an anatomy physiology book, but everybody's got a thinker and a feeler. And the problem with that is our thinker and our feeler are not always on the same page. They're not even in the same book sometimes. And we can really struggle. You know, hopefully we see things as God sees them in our head. You know, hopefully we cultivate you know, we educate ourselves in regard to God's will and we develop his perspective. But that doesn't change the fact that we have a feeler. And sometimes, though, we can see something. It's just a house. Just a house. Yeah, but our feeler doesn't say it's just a house. So we've got our thinker realizing something, our feeler feeling something else, and that's what I call confliction. And that's part of the struggle with life after loss and living with our losses. It's a real struggle. When my wife died on Christmas morning of 2013, she began to enjoy something far beyond, far better than anything in this world. Now, I knew that in my head. But how do you think my feeler was handling that? See, that's a different story. Let's talk about what this is like. Loss is change that's forced on you. No, nobody, nobody says in life, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose loss. I'm going to choose to lose my health. Or I'm going to choose to lose this friend. Or I'm going to choose to lose my job. You know, we don't, loss is a forced change. It's not something we choose. It's something forced on us and we have to deal with it. It's kind of like, it's kind of like this. Ladies, what is this? Okay, it's a gift. Now, ladies, have you ever been given something that you didn't want? You ever gotten a gift? I hope it wasn't from your husband. Uh, though I made that mistake one time in 41 years of marriage. Unforgettable experience. Uh, okay, let's assume that you get a gift you don't want. Okay, men, you can go to sleep here for a few minutes because you, you're clu clueless about this. Uh, women, if you get a gift you don't want, what do you do with it? You, okay, you re-gift it. That's one option. What's another option? Return it. There's another option. What else? Throw it away. What else? Put it in the back of the closet. I think that exhausts all the options. Okay, now you get the idea. Okay. Life sometimes gives you things you don't want. You would never re-gift. You cannot exchange. You cannot hide it away and forget about it. You're forced to deal with it. So what are you going to do with it? That is tough. That's when life really gets tough. When life gives you something you don't want and you're stuck with it the rest of your life. Learning to live with that is really hard. I speak from experience. I'm sure some of you can too. Now, what we've got to realize is that with every loss, there's a new beginning. With every loss, there's a new beginning. Now, we don't know what the new beginning is when we experience the loss, but there is a new beginning. Change is about an ending and a new beginning, but there's something else also. There's this neutral zone. And the way I depict it is with this picture. When you suffer loss, when you're forced to deal with loss, you enter into a neutral zone. You can't just automatically go to a new beginning. You enter into this neutral zone, and it's kind of like a forest, and it's the weirdest forest you could ever imagine. Let me tell you a little bit about this forest. There are no footprints. There are no pathways. No footprints, no pathways, but there are people. Now, I told you it was crazy, okay? You can't follow the footprints 
to get out of the forest. There's no path to follow to get out of the forest. You've got to find your way through the forest. Now, there are people, and some of those people are a really wonderful blessing. Comforting, helpful, encouraging. Some of those people, no. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why we need to study loss is so that we can be less neglectful and less abusive to people who've suffered loss. Because sometimes we do the dumbest stuff. We say the stupidest stuff. Sometimes the most hurtful things to people who suffer loss. And we don't even know it. As a matter of fact, you can Google stupid things said to widows and widowers. You might find it interesting. It's a long list, by the way. And it's true of anybody who suffers any kind of serious loss. There are some really dumb things we can say. Like, for instance, the woman who loses her child prenatally. And then we come up to her and we comfort her. And we tell her, honey, you're young. You can get pregnant again. Put that on the list of really stupid things to say to that young lady who needs to focus on her loss. And that's as much a loss as if that child had been born and postnatally that child died at age 4, age 10, or age 20. She has suffered a loss that needs to be recognized. Too often we do not recognize that loss, much to the detriment of these young ladies and young men who have lost children that way. But we can say sometimes the dumbest things and do sometimes the dumbest things. That's why we need to study about loss and about grief, about what it's like and how we can be a better help. Knowing more about what it's like, we can more likely be more effective in comforting, strengthening people who are experiencing life after loss. There are some people, um, after you suffer loss, who are going to be hurtful to you. That's just the way it is. But there's also people who are going to be helpful to you, and then there's going to be people who are going to neglect you. I read this, and I did not believe it the first time I read it, but when I read it the second time, I thought, okay, I've got to accept this. When, with, when married people lose their spouses, it is very typical for them to lose 75% of their social network. 75% of their social network. And the reason why is because that makes people feel uncomfortable. And when we're uncomfortable with something, we just keep backing away. And there's a lot of neglect that people experience when they experience loss. Please don't ever let yourself be like that. Be like a first responder who, when you hear the gunshot, you run to the gunshot. Or when you smell the smoke or see the burning flames, you run into the house. Be that kind of a person. That's a godly heart. That's a follower of Jesus who's willing to throw themselves under the bus, expose themselves to extremely difficult, painful situations because they want to help others. But some way, somehow, you're going to have to find your way through the forest. Now, the question is, how long is that going to take? That's a really good question, and I have not a clue. I don't know. And what's really disconcerting is you don't either. You just got to keep working on it. Sunday morning in the sermon, we're going to be talking about waiting on the Lord. Boy, that's a hard thing to do. You know, sometimes in life you're in God's waiting room and you have not an idea of how long you're going to be there. You're kind of like an egg in, a, in an incubator or a butterfly waiting to bust out of that cocoon. You know, you, you, you're just going to be there for a while. You're going to have to work on your life situation. During that time when, when you're in that forest, it's like a transitional period, a neutral zone. William Bridges has written a lot about transitions. His books are really great. I highly recommend them. And this is um, a theory of his that I have tried to depict in this particular PowerPoint slide. We've got to give ourselves time to work on ourselves, to heal, to recuperate, when you have lost, especially a person of great significance in your life, 
Look at yourself as like being in an ICU. You are in need of critical care. You can't be an outpatient. You have no business being in a regular room. You need to realize that you need critical care. You're in an intensive care unit in your life for a while. You need to recognize that. You need to be willing to accept the help of others during that period of time. You need to act like you're in an intensive care unit for your own benefit. Hopefully, gradually, you can graduate from that to a regular room and eventually out of the hospital, so to speak. But you've got to be patient with yourself while you're working through this. During that period of time, that neutral zone time, you need to come up with your new beginning. What do you want after your loss? What, what's your definition of your new beginning? You've got to come up with that. And then you've got to decide, okay, how can I get there? One of the good definitions of leadership, I think, is the ability to move a group from point B to point A with the least amount of friction. Well, what you need to do is be a leader of yourself. Okay, you're at point B. What is your point A and how do you get there? That's up to you. That's a personal choice. There's a lot of variations in life circumstances that would affect what you decide about your new beginning. But you've got to decide what it is, and then you've got to work toward it. And I have no earthly idea how long that's going to take. <clears throat> I'll tell you what you need. More than anything is you need the Lord. I call this the Hobby Lobby verse in the Bible. <clears throat> you can find it on home interior products there. But those who wait on the Lord, there's that phrase. What about them? They shall renew their strength. The word renew there can also be translated change. How do you renew or change your strength? You swap your so-called strength for the Lord's strength, and then you're able to mount up with wings like eagles, run and not be weary, walk and not be faint. You need the Lord. I love this spirit. When my heart's overwhelmed, what do you do when your heart's overwhelmed? You suffered painful loss in your life. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That's it. Do you know what you need more than anything else when you suffered loss? You need the Lord. Do you know what you need when you are blessed? You need the Lord. You know what? You need the Lord all the time. One of the blessings that comes in loss is a clearer recognition of your tremendous need for the Lord. How odd it is that with the affliction of severe loss could come the greater clarity about the greatest need. One thing I highly recommend for people who've suffered loss is do this. Man, don't waste your pain. You paid too dearly. Don't waste your pain. There are three mottos of the widowhood workshop ministry one's back there on the back wall and then there's this one over here and then there's this one here don't waste your pain what have you been through in your life that's been painful well whatever that is don't waste it let me tell you about miss carolyn miss carolyn was a member of the church in hartville ohio where i preached I went with her to the doctor with some of her family. She got a horrible cancer diagnosis. She was terminal. It was about as ugly a diagnosis as you could get. Before the doctor left that room where we were all meeting, I said, doctor, could we spend a few moments talking about this and spend some time in prayer before we leave? And he granted us that permission. So the doctor left. We talked about what we'd heard. And we spent some time in prayer. After we did that, Miss Carolyn and her husband went to the office, took care of the details there, and then we stepped outside the building. This was January in Northeast Ohio. It was cold, it was snowing. Butch, the husband, who was an alcoholic, these kids got married when they were teenagers, and he became an alcoholic. She was 
with him the entire time. Um, she was faithful to the Lord that entire time. He was a drunk. He was sober that particular morning. But we moved outside the building. He said, let me go out and get the truck and I'll pull it up to the door. So he goes out to the parking lot to get the truck. As he was out in the parking lot, Carolyn said, now this is 30 minutes after a horrible diagnosis. She said, well, maybe this will bring Butch back to the Lord. Whoa. I'll never forget that. In her pain, she wanted some value, something good to come from her pain. She wanted her husband. He was an unfaithful Christian for decades. How in the world that woman put up with him, I do not know, but she did. You know what happened? Her desire was granted. He came back to the Lord. He did. She passed away. Um, one of the issues that I think we have in the church is the quality or level or degree of our fellowship. It's not near as deep and as intimate as it should be. I think we need to develop a more transparent culture and a more secure culture in our church families. People sometimes who are struggling in their marriages They do so so privately and seek no assistance. And there's no no wonder their marriage crashes and burns. Nobody's been there to help them. People are troubled with dysfunctional families. People are troubled with incorrigible delinquents, kids. People have all kinds of... There's not a single person who comes in this room and sits that doesn't bring in baggage with them. You just can't see it. A lot of it, probably most of it, Maybe all of it, you don't even know about it. We need to be more willing to share our personal struggles for the purpose of helping other people. You know, yes, it's painful. It's painful, these things that we've gone through, but in the painful things we've gone through, can we use them to help other people? If you've been through cancer, Can you help other cancer patients? If you've been through bankruptcy or you've lost the business that you invested so much of yourself and your life in, can you help somebody else with that? If you've gone through divorce, can you help somebody else because of the pain that you went through in your divorce? What can you do with the pain that you've experienced? Glorifying God is choosing to use your pain to help other people. Man, that's, that's the way to have an effect on other people. Many of you, I'm sure, remember Batsel Barrett Baxter, one of the great preachers in the Restoration Movement. He was on Herald of Truth radio and TV programs for years and years. He was the face and the, and the words of the Herald of Truth ministry for decades. He got cancer, by the way, and he's also passed away. He was a professor at... Uh, at the time, David Lipscomb College, it was called. He wrote a book called When Life Tumbles In. Let me read to you a quote out of that book. A man of great wisdom. When we must carry heavy burdens, we receive our greatest help, not from those who, having never carried similar burdens, stand on the sidelines and give bland advice, but from those who have been through the same valleys and have suffered the same problems. Oh yeah, amen. That is so true. How many of you uh, saw the movie, I Can Only Imagine, back a few years ago? Oh, most of you. Such a neat, powerful movie. If you've never seen that movie, you really ought to watch it. It's worth your time. Great moral value in that movie. Here's this kid that grows up in a dysfunctional family. He has a father who's a monster. And uh, his mother, eventually, she can't stand it anymore. And she deserts. She leaves the family. Leaves the boy stuck with, um, the teenage boy stuck with his dad who's a monster. He finds some relief in his music um, engagement. So he plays the guitar, he writes lyrics, he sings. And that's how he survived that time with his father. 
When he graduated from high school, he left home. And uh, certainly couldn't blame him, considering who he was living with. And so there, out there in the world, he gets this job setting up for this concert for this group. And the bad thing about this group is their lead singer doesn't show up. He overhears this conversation. He has these chords in his hands that he's setting up. And he says, hey, guys, I, uh, I can sing. Um, I'll sing for you. And they let him start singing with them. They bought a, they, they got a bus. They painted the bus. It's kind of like the Partridge family. That's another thing you can Google, you who are younger. Google Partridge family, the bus. Anyway, they got this bus, the school bus, painted it up, started going all over the place and doing these little venues. And they were wanting to hit it big. And all during the time, that lead singer, who had grown up with that monster of a father and that dysfunctional family, he keeps contacting this agent, wanting to get that agent to come listen to them. The agent does begin to show a little bit of interest. At a turning point in the movie, he gets in that boy's face. The agent does. And the agent says, son, you're decent, but you'll never go very far in this industry until... You take your pain and you turn it into your inspiration. Take your pain and turn it into your inspiration. We have the power to do that. It's within our ability to take our pain and convert that pain, that burden, actually into a blessing for other people. That kid went home. It took a while, but... He was able to get reconciled with his father. His father had in some way found the Lord and, and they developed a relationship. The boy left home again, reunited with those guys and they hit the charts. I can only imagine a song that was a huge hit and they've had some others. The group is called Mercy Me. What we can do in our life is we can take the painful things we've experienced and use them to help other people. That's bringing glory to God, not in spite of, but because of what we've experienced in our life. That is a really neat thing to do with the awful things that we've experienced in our life. That is really how the Widowhood Workshop got... That's bad English. How the Widowhood Workshop got born. (laughs) That's how that happened. In the um, middle of January, a couple weeks after my wife died, I went on a search on the internet to find help for widows and widowers because I was a mess. I was struggling. And you know what I found? Virtually nothing. And I thought, man, somebody ought to do something because if I'm a mess, um, I figure there's a lot of other people are too. And so my whole family bought into this, and my whole family, uh, I call them the board of directors for the Widowhood Workshop Ministry. There are 11 of them. Uh, I have three daughters, two sons-in-law, and five grandchildren, and the five grandchildren are a part of the ministry as well. And we all have our responsibilities in this ministry, and what we want to do is we want to take our loss. They lost their mother. They lost their nana. I lost my wife. What we want to do is take the pain of that loss and we want to bring glory to God by trying to help others. Now, tomorrow, the focus is not exclusively on, but is a lot on loss of spouse. And one thing that I have to admit and ashamed to admit is the fact that prior to my wife's death, I never preached one sermon about widowhood, not one. I also never read one book about widowhood when I was married. I wish I had. I would have been a better husband. I would have been a better local preacher because there was a lot that I was ignorant about because I was inexperienced. But I'm not so inexperienced anymore. Now, let me share with you before we dismiss, and we will dismiss in just a couple minutes, uh, this display table is a bunch of stuff that I have benefited tremendously from. Uh, Please, let me tell you about the unpardonable sin. There's discussions about this in Bible classes occasionally. 
The unpardonable sin is when you steal the preacher's books in the house of the Lord. These are my books, okay? These are my books. Do not steal my books. I have benefited tremendously from these books. If you'd like to get some of these books and you don't know how to do it, just take a picture of it and then hand your phone to somebody younger than you are and they'll have them delivered right to your door. It's real easy. It really is. Uh, So I hope that uh, tonight, today, tonight, tomorrow, and even Sunday, that some people will browse and find some help for them. Now, over here on this side, you can take this stuff home. There are some business cards from the ministry. There are a lot of white sheets here. You're welcome to take uh, any of those. There's also a track here, first come, first serve. I may run out of these even this afternoon. This track is a really neat track written by a couple of brothers in the Lord. How can I help myself and others in times of grief? But all of this stuff, you're, wel- you're welcome to take any of the stuff that you would like. And if it can be of help to you, it'd be great. If you want to use it to help other people, that would be great uh, as well. I attend, when I'm at home, the Villa Rica Church of Christ, which is 40 miles west of Atlanta, just off of I-20. And um, a couple weeks ago, there was a, a young man who took his own life in front of his wife and children. And there's a young lady in the Villa Rica Church of Christ, her name is Ashley, who took it upon herself on Thursday to take one of the books I'd written and go visit with that very young widow. Ashley wanted to go and help. Somebody, Ashley is a realtor. She had helped this couple buy this home, I think it was in October of last year. And now here this young widow is with young children, huge mortgage. So Ashley goes, takes one of my books, even sits and reads. They read together the first chapter of the book. And she reported to me just yesterday about how good that that visit was and how she intends to do follow-up visits. She's trying to help somebody else who's going through an agonizing time in her life. Ashley's never experienced the loss of her husband. She herself is pregnant, has a little boy named Jet. My family calls him Jet Jet, but uh, she's wanting to help somebody else. You know, learning some about this kind of stuff can help you be more effective in helping other people. And that's why I appreciate people like you who are willing to come out and be a part of this kind of conversation. I want to thank you again for uh, your time. And I want to spend a little bit of time in prayer uh, before we dismiss. Can we do that? Father in heaven, thank you for the blessings, the innumerable blessings that we do not deserve. Thank you. Father, sometimes thank you is an is a woefully inadequate two-word phrase. And it sure is woefully inadequate today. You've blessed us beyond measure and beyond merit. Thank you, Father. Father, thank you for being with us in our losses. Help us to learn more about loss and the impact of loss so that we can more effectively help other people. Help us, Father, to develop strength, wisdom, to be able to glorify you in even more ways by learning and growing ourselves and helping others. Father, I thank you for every person who came today. And Father, expectantly, we thank you for the people who will come this this evening. We pray, Father, that this will be a weekend that will be helpful and maybe will be something that might even help people come to the Lord as we minister to them during their time of greatest need. Father, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of the sin of neglect. Forgive us, Father, when we have chosen to back away from uncomfortable situations because it made us feel uncomfortable. Help us to be better than that. Father, be with us and keep us safe the remainder of this day. Give us a good night's rest tonight, please. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. 
Amen. Thank you very, very much. Tomorrow is next.